Welcome back to MVM. Today we have a review. This is for an upcoming game from Hurricane Games. It is a two-player game, head-to-head -head from Bruno Catala and Thea Riviere, Nagaraja. Yeah, Nagaraja. We had a chance to see this at Gen Con just last week as of filming. And when we say new, it's that new. In fact, I think this copy might be one of the only f copies floating about. Yeah, and I'm not quite sure if this is the done version. We have the rules, finally, and the rules, the graphic design looks a little bit different. Yeah. So what you see here may be the final version and it may not. However, the gameplay stands and it's a fascinating game. Yeah, this is a great two-player game. We both love the designers. Uh, there's another one. Bruno's been ripping it up lately with a lot of games and with a little help here, he's put together a really cool two-player game unlike anything I've seen. So the idea here is that each of you guys are throwing or casting these fate sticks. These fate sticks are kind of like dice. They're going to have fate points on some of them and they're going to have Raja or Naga on, on the other sides which allow you to cast spells. The number of these you're going to be throwing is dependent upon the cards that you use and each of these are going to be randomly dealt and acquired round after round. But the trick here is that each of the players is going to have a board in front of them. This is a three by three or nine spaces. And on the outskirts of this, you're gonna have relics. There are three of the nine relics that are cursed. And if at any time on your board, you uncover three of all three of those, you lose the game and the other player wins. However, all of the uh, artifacts are gonna have victory points on them. And if at any time you have a total of 25 or higher with those and some of the bonus tokens, you win the game and you reveal those to the other players. So there's a cool dynamic back and forth here of how you can manipulate your board and how you can manipulate the board of your opponent. Yeah, so how do you manipulate your board? You're going to be using this other component here, these tiles. The game is about building routes on your board from these three entrance spaces to the various relics on your board. It's not just pure luck, although it can be, you can look at these things. A lot of these spells allow you to, like Jeremy said, manipulate not only the tiles on the board, but those relics surrounding the board. I might peek at some of mine. I might look at some of Jeremy's. We mm -hmm. might move them around. You can really mess with your opponent in this game. So if we fail to say, all of these are starting face down, so you have no idea how <laughs> right. these are randomly distributed on your board. All right, so the game is incredibly simple. Each player is gonna be dealt five cards at the very start of the game. You're gonna determine a first player. You're gonna be using cards in order to do a couple different things. Now. Let's talk about the anatomy of a card first before we talk about how the game is played, or we can talk about them both at the same time. When you look at the card itself, at the, uh, at the top, and again, the graphic design may change here, but you're gonna see an icon. This is denotes what the overall kind of effect is yeah. of that card itself. It's also important because if you have like icons in the cards you play, you can play multiple cards in a turn. It's also gonna show you what type of the three different types of fate sticks that you're allowed to cast that turn. So in this case, if I played just this card, I could cast one white and two greens. And at the bottom is the effect you get to use if you cast that spell. Now, you're either playing the card for the fate sticks or you're playing the card to cast the spell, not both at the same time. Right, and as Jeremy said, he would have put, just played that one card, but if you use two like symbols, you could play two or more cards of that same type for the fate sticks. Mm -hmm. And if you do, you're gonna collect a bunch of fate sticks. In this example, I'm gonna have a total of five green fate sticks and two white. And it should be noted, the green fate sticks are a little bit more 50-50, but you're gonna more likely get some uh, Naga. To be whereas right, yep. all the way up to the brown, they don't have any Naga whatsoever. It's all about the pips. There are four different types of icons at the top. Again, those uh, refer to the four different types of abilities that you can have within the game. Let's also talk about the bottom portion because when you roll or cast your dice, you can also use from any cards remaining the bottom portion. These are the abilities or spells that you can cast if you are able to give up one of your squiggly Naga things here. All right, so let's talk about the bottoms. There's a variety of different things. I have some here. There's some that allow you just to add pips to your overall total kind of as a surprise. There's some that discard cards from the other player's hand randomly. There's ones that allow you to like gather cards from the discard pile in your hand and even manipulate or move tiles on the board. Yeah, I have some here. Like I said earlier, I could peek using this card at either one of my relics or one of Jeremy's. You can move some relics around. And what's interesting about this one is if Jeremy's uncovered one of his safe relics or non-cursed ones, 
I might be able to peek at one of his, find out it's cursed, and then swap those two, thereby putting his cursed one out and his safe one face down. Yep. One of the things you also need to notice is that each of these icons has arrows on them denoting whether it affects your opponent, or whether it affects you, or whether it affects either one of your choice. So you can't just cast spells on other players if the card doesn't affect them particularly. So. Yeah, and they change that up. There are some peak cards that's only for looking at your opponent, and yep. then there's some that allow you to do either. And then, of course, there's a few that allow you to manipulate dice. This one allows you to reroll two of the fate sticks. This one targets your opponent's fate sticks, and they have to get rid of one. Okay, so how does the game actually work? We kind of talked through the cards themselves. So starting with the first player, in this case, David, since he has the compass. Now this isn't the compass that's gonna be used in the <laughs> game. No. We got this as kind of a special token. So he's gonna look through his hand and decide how many cards he wishes to play since he is the first player. When he does so, he just lays them face down. And I would look at my hand as well and play them face down. We reveal them at the same time. Now note, if you're playing multiple cards, as we said, they have to have the same icon in the upper left-hand corner. Once you play the cards, you're going to collect all the fate sticks according to whatever those are. So you're just going to collect those on your side. In this case, I would collect one white and seven green. Oh boy. And each player is just going to roll those up. Now, they're going to kind of pull their fate pips to one side and pull their naga or their squigglies to the other side. And this is going to tell the other player who is winning that battle because at the end of the round, it really is just determined by whoever has the most pips on their dice. But starting with the first player, they have the ability to cast spells from the rest of the cards that they have in their hand by giving up any of the squigglies back to the pool. And you can play pretty, pretty much any card that you so wish, but hand management in this game is extremely important, so you don't want to dump your hand every round. Yeah, and it's very interesting too because you have to do that one at a time. So if I discard a Naga on a Fate Stick, I play one card, then it's Jeremy's turn. So it's a little bit of a back and forth. It's going to go until two consecutive passes. So I would have to pass, then Jeremy would have to pass, or vice versa. Then whoever has the most pips is going to acquire the tile. When you collect the tile, you're then allowed to place that tile anywhere on your board according to two rules. Number one, it has to be placed adjacent to an entrance or adjacent to a previously placed tile on the board. When you place that tile, you just lock it into place. Some of them are gonna have these tokens on them. As long as it connects back to your main area, you can collect this token in secret. These tokens do a variety of things like maybe some hidden victory points, maybe the ability to draw extra cards, maybe the ability to do other things within the game. Then if it touches any of the outside relics or artifacts, you have to immediately flip that up. In this case, that's four victory points plus the two hidden from my hand, I'm six points towards my 25 and winning the game. So you can see this game is all about manipulating, finding routes, and then manipulating other players' boards. Yeah, in order to get those relics or to get those tokens, you have to connect those things back to those three entrances, which can get really tricky, particularly if your opponent is messing with your board. Now, I think the genius behind the game is the hand management, because at the end of the round, this is what happens. A new token is flipped up, so everyone sees what that tile is, and then the player who lost the round, in this case, David, he's going to draw three cards, always three cards. He looks at all three of them. He chooses two of them to keep into his hand, and then he gives the other player one card. So this, you know, if I used all my cards, I'm going into the next round with one card and no other cards to cast spells. So it's just a pure luck for me at that point. So being able to draw cards and be able to manage those hand of cards is extremely important. Not only that, but the abilities on the bottom, because once you start locking these into place, you have to really think about how you want to manage their board, how you can manipulate their tiles around so that it maybe gets one of their cursed artifacts and so forth. Yeah, the other great thing about that is if you're the person looking at those three cards, you're choosing that one card to give to your opponent. So yep. if you can get into their head and determine what kind of game they're wanting to play. Do they want to play a really interactive game? Then deny them the cards that are going to allow you to allow them to do things to your board. Again, the game is going to be played like that back and forth until one of two things happens. One, if any player has uh, all three of their cursed relics revealed, they lose. Or if one player has 25 victory points claimed on their side without the cursed relics contributing to three. The other way, actually the game can actually end in one other way. If all nine of the spaces on a player's board are completed, then you're just going to see who has the most victory points at that point. We so, haven't had that happen no, yet. No, no, it usually ends before that. So that's Nagaraja. What do you think about it? I love this game. Yeah. This is probably, uh, I've not played all the games from our Gen Con hall, but 
this game is probably a candidate for my favorite game of Gen Con 2018 for sure. I love two-player games. There's This is doing things that I've never seen it do before. Uh, one of the things in particular that you just mentioned that I like, the cursed treasures. You think the cursed treasures, you don't want to flip them, right? You do. But you do. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to flip three of them because yeah. the cursed treasures, I think, are all six. worth six points. Yeah. So they can contribute to that 25 significantly. So if you can push your luck, flip two of those cursed treasures, and run to 25 before your opponent flips your third or you flip your third, you could win the game. Yeah, there's also some really tricky hand management in this game, as I've, as I've said a couple times. Which cards you use in order to cast those fate sticks is extremely important, but also the cards that you keep in your hand because you want to be able to view other players' tokens. You want to know where their cursed treasures are because once they flip two of them, you want to manipulate their boards with other cards so you can create paths that unlock those to them because there's multiple things that you have to think about in this game. Not only uncovering yours, but trying to deny them or uncovering their three cursed. So there's a lot of things to think about with the cards, not just how you play them, but the order in which you play them in. Oh, absolutely. And one other thing too, I mentioned the dice. A lot of people see something like this and think luck, luck, luck. These things, you can mitigate this significantly. Yep. What I will say about it, it has what I would do, uh, regard as the perfect amount of luck in this game. It's that yep. exciting level of luck where you're rolling these dice. And where that comes into play most for me is when you roll those dice and you don't get a Naga. Uh, because then you're kind of, you feel a little naked <laughs> yeah. uh, for the rest of that round because if he had two Naga, he knows that he can spend his Naga and do some powers and I'm defenseless. Yeah. I really can't do anything more to adjust the pips on my fate sticks. That is an interesting situation and it all comes down to the cards you play and the dice you select. Yeah, and it's very interesting too because as, as you said at the very beginning, some of the larger sticks, the whites and the browns, have a large number of those fate pips on them. These only have two of them, so it's a 50-50 chance, but they have a large chance to be able to cast. So do you want to roll dice that are fate sticks that may allow you to cast spells, or do you want to want roll ones that are just going to lock up that tile for you? Exactly, and back to your point about hand management, that also comes into play with how many cards you have in your hand. Mm -hmm. If you lose a lot of tiles at the beginning of the game, you're going to find yourself in round three or four with a bunch of cards in your hand, yeah. which set you up for at least one, if not two, really solid turns if you want to go with the Nagas. I honestly can't think of many cons about the game. It's it's super solid. No, it's really solid. This is definitely would be in my collection of two-player games for sure, bar none. So Naga Raja, I have no idea when this game is coming out. <laughs> I think it's maybe around Essen. It's still a ways off. It's yeah. not being produced. I think this is just a very early look at the game. If you guys have any questions about it, make them in the comments below. Subscribe to us, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, everything else that we do, and we will catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.